All right. Kind of looks like the Hollywood Squares version of yeah. you know, Because God Said So. <laughs> so well, we're just waiting for ready. somebody to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait for somebody to join us here. Um, <clears throat> got everybody's name up. Hey, there's David Ketterman joining us this evening, a friend of our ministry and a friend to many. That's that's uh, oh, David Ketterman's absolutely uh, label, he is. a friend to many. Uh, hey, uh, there's a, a, a some guy named Jermaine Thomas is joining the show in the chat room. Wow. Tonight. Who is that? <laughs> what an honor. Should sure. we be scared? <laughs> <laughs> my, double, my social media doppelganger. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and other people are joining in this evening as we get going. There's uh, um, uh, Tenderheart, who is uh, Anna, uh, who works with WBSU. Uh, Deborah is joining us this morning, or this evening, rather. Uh, I've had computer problems all day long, literally, so I kind of got morning and evening mixed up. But hey, everybody, this is Dr. Bill of the World Bible School, and welcome to Heal Because God Said So where we kind of dance around healing, but we really talk about how to change the way you think so that you don't have to deal with all of that other stuff all of the time. Uh, so uh, we're glad to have everybody joining us. Um, a lot more is joined. There's, a, there's a, a, a guy that we know as Michael Porter that's joining in the chat room uh, tonight. And um, uh, I'm all about multiple devices, but uh, not during not during all the stuff I got to handle in the control room here. So uh, it's just good to see everybody. And I know there's many that have already joined us who haven't even uh, tapped into the chat room. And that's cool, too. Uh, good to have our panel back with us tonight uh, for part three of our discussion as we're talking uh, about uh, no warfare living from rest and what a beautiful uh, topic awesome. that we've been discussing. Uh, good to have Apostle Michael Porter, uh, Dr. Catherine Toon, and Apostle Jermaine Thomas back with us this evening. You are all such a blessing uh, to uh, uh, World Bible School and uh, to the online uh, portion of our ministry. Uh, we've been talking about this living from rest thing, but doing it from the aspect of staying out of this warfare mindset. And we began talking two weeks ago about, uh, well, three weeks now, about um, this concept of spiritual warfare. It's unfortunate that much of the, let me just say it this way, the religious mindset believes that we must be engaged in this spiritual warfare in order to get anything done, to make any progress in our lives. When in reality, that's really a um, kind of an opposite end of the spectrum of if God has done everything, if our creator has established everything, if he even sent Jesus to, to remind us of all of that that we've been created in, uh, and then yet we're going to work really hard in all this warfare and pray and fast and seek God and do all this stuff, uh, it kind of really does take away from the, 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 the final process of things and and so you know it's not that there are not struggles uh, which i've learned to refer to as challenges in our lives there there are challenges that we face but but where is the battle where is that source of of this this need to fight and and where it's dealt with and we we've kind of talked about this a whole lot in different aspects different scriptures the, the scripture we've been highlighting on is from second corinthians 10 3 for though we walk in the flesh we do not war according to the flesh but for tonight i want to read this um from the passion translation i'm sorry from the mirror bible uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and then we're going to have uh, our panel talk about this. We're going to start with uh, Apostle Michael Porter tonight um, uh, and uh, see where we go with this. Uh, the Mirror Bible, we haven't used on this uh, particular segment yet, but it says the fact that we are living in a physical world in human bodies of flesh does not mean that we engage ourselves in a combat dictated to by the typical uh, tit for tat uh, strategies of the politics <laughs> of that day. What a wording. Uh, verse four yes. says the dynamic 
of our strategy is revealed in God's ability to disengage mindsets and perceptions that have held people captive in pseudo fortresses uh, for centuries. Verse 5 says, every lofty idea and argument positioned against the knowledge of God is cast down and exposed to be a mere invention of our own imagination. We arrest every thought that could possibly trigger an opposing threat to our redeemed identity and innocence at spear point. Great. Caliber. Now, notice the wording of the word caliber, C-A-L-I-B-R-E, which is the old English, uh, the the uh, the old, old English way of saying it, but it's really caliber. Uh, the caliber of thought, uh, the caliber of our weapon is empowered by the revelation of the <clears throat> ultimate consequence of the obedience oh, of so Christ. Good. I yeah. love that it doesn't say by our obedience, yeah. but it was by the obedience yes. of Christ. So, also, Michael, bring us into this tonight, uh, and let's deal with this internal conflict, this thing that people really do battle with. So uh, get us started tonight, please. Okay. Um, I'd really like to start by the Passion nails it to the Passion Translation. Mm-hmm. So let me, let me read that really quick here. It says, for although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing mm-hmm. human weapons. Listen at this part using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defense of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. So, I, you know, I, I just had this thought. I, it says we walk we walk according to the power of the knowledge of Christ. I, I just got to thinking about this power. And, you know, in, in general terms and in, in in past thinking, I would always think about the power of Christ in terms of doing something, mm-hmm. of him doing something, you know, healing this person and raising this person from the dead. And I'm not saying that he doesn't do those things, but I've been rethinking it lately. And instead of thinking about the power of Christ being powered to do something, I've been thinking about the power of Christ in the power to believe something mm-hmm. or the power to control what I perceive. In other words, the power of Christ is in my life to give me control over my thoughts and feelings. And this is what we master. And as we master this, it's the conscious power of thought is the gift God has given man. The conscious power of thought is my thinking. And this walking or this movement or this life is all the way back in Genesis tied into, I believe, the dominion of man in that it was implanted in or engrafted in man from the beginning. And as we exercise this power over thinking, this power over belief systems, we, it leads us into resurrection life. We believe, we change what we believe, and as we change what we believe, the power of Christ working in us causes us to manifest what we believe. You know, we've been talking about that on a number of shows, so... As we said um, last week, you know, if you think that in the terms of one spirit, one Lord, one faith, then you begin to believe like the one. And when you believe like the one, you actually begin to figure out, haven't mastered it yet, but on the journey of beginning to figure out that it's his life we're living and that he has no battles before him. He has no enemies He is Christus Victor, Christ the Victorious. And when we live out of the conscious awareness of Christus Victor, then all of a sudden we are seated in a seat of rest at the right hand of the Father. We're in the garden. We're in paradise. We're in whatever you want to call it, this conscious awareness. And this brings down any opposition whatsoever. And the awareness becomes nothing but victory, nothing but love, nothing but life, nothing but liberty and freedom. 
And by the way, the freedom that we begin to understand is not freedom to do something, but freedom to be able to live his life and express his life, which is the perfect life. And so, I don't know, I believe this spiritual power is omnipresent with us in that in, in this consciousness of omnipresence, all things really are possible yeah. all at once. And so as this is presented and released in our um, awareness, we have the ability to pull down any erroneous thinking, any in error belief systems. And I believe that this is happening within us now that the spirit of God is energizing us to mm-hmm. move in this direction. Yep. And it's effortlessly what what I, what I was trained to do was be constantly doing something, constantly mm-hmm. trying to find the answer, even in right. my church, churchy stuff, you know, even in my going to church and participating in church. It was all about a journey to get somewhere. And little did I know I was already where I was trying to get to Come on, I, sir. My, my position is. Now I relax in where I am and let the, the I amness of where I am just lead me into life, just lead me into the expression of life. And so this, this walk, we appear as if we're in a mortal flesh, but we're not really mortal, just mere, I think Dr. K. Fairchild says, we're not mere human beings. And as we rise up in the consciousness that we're not mere human beings, we put off this fleshly or mortal concept of consciousness and I believe that's the scripture that it, it, it applies here that says this mortality, this mortal put, must put on immortality. I believe all that's in the thinking, all that's in consciousness. So as we acknowledge the power of Christ in us, we begin to live this magnificent, this beautiful, this all encompassing, this no enemies from a throne room perspective, if you will, or a spirit perspective or heavenly perspective. I'm, I'm trying not to make it sound any way churchy at all. And um, so this is this is all about not me doing something anymore. I, I kind of just jumped in my memory. I love something that Dr. Lynn Howes says. He says this right here. He says, if you if you go somewhere and you hear someone say that you have to do something, it's probably not the gospel. But if you hear yeah. someone tell you that you need to believe something, it's probably the gospel. That's good. And that's, that's, that's that good. is good. That's excellent. And, and so that is this journey of discovery that we're on. And I'm just going to say this. I won't speak for the panel, but sometimes it feels harder to do nothing yeah. than it was to that's try good. to do a bunch of things because you sit mm-hmm. here and you want to participate in the process and you are participating by living his life, but you get what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. you, you stop doing all of that must do, must go, must be, must give, must support, must whatever. And there's no more must do. You're just led by the spirit. It's not saying you don't do anything. It's just the things you do. You're led by the spirit to do yeah. them. And they come effortlessly and they come with energy and they come with power and they come with anointing, whatever term you want to put on it. And it just flows and it just manifests. And the things we've been trying to do for so long have not happened in many cases because we were trying to do them. Yes. And we thought if we tried and just said in the name of Jesus on our try, somehow it would work. But it doesn't work that way. It's when we live out of the nature of the character and the personhood of Christ whom we are. Yeah, because we treated the name of Jesus as if it was the magic hot button that really caused everything. Oh, right. yeah. I, I just yeah. posted, I have a reoccurring post every few months that I use that says prayer changes things is not in your Bible. All yeah. things are possible to those who believe is in your yeah. Bible. Yeah. And yeah. it's usually about the demand of doing that really gets people hung up. But, you know, to believe. Uh, Dr. Catherine, talk to us about this tonight. Awesome. Well, I've been so enjoying this. Um, thank you, Michael. That was amazing. Uh, you know, as you were speaking, the Lord is just speaking to me. He was saying that your physicality does not identify you. Your physicality does not locate you. And so we definitely have physical bodies. And that's not to say that the physical is uh, to be disdained because uh, one member of the Trinity will for eternity have a human body in the incarnation he showed God showed how much he values the mm-hmm. physical human body and our humanity. Um, so uh, so we don't want to get all dualistic where we're just kind of gnostically uh, kind of floating. And that's the only thing that matters. 
However, our life source does not come from our physicality. It comes from, uh, from spirit. And so, uh, so it's, it's so important that as we are uh, operating in a physical body and just with a weakness of our frame, which is not just our physical body that gets tired and has symptoms and doesn't cooperate all the time, but also the physicality of our, our, our mind that is not renewed, uh, you know, uh, all of those places that are not in line with what God is saying, our unrenewed mind. And so uh, it's important that even while we're embracing our, our the physicality and the carnal and, and subduing it to yield to uh, Christ in us, the hope of glory and his mind and all of that, that we're not uh, booting out the baby with the bathwater because uh, those things matter. They're just being uh, renewed and conforming into the image of Christ. Uh, but I was I was really enjoying both of those translations that you were using. I, I actually hadn't read this mirror translation, so that's really fun. But I, I love the way it brings out every lofty idea and argument positioned against the knowledge of God. And that can come in so many different ways. You know, as I shared my testimony that I, when I won't do it again, so don't worry. But um, <laughs> that I, I, was, I was not brought up in church. I was brought up, up in the church of hum humanism. And there are a whole lot of lofty ideas exalting themselves up against the knowledge of God. So, you know, religion has a lot of different flavors, doesn't it? But, you know, it's interesting because um, these are positioned against the knowledge of God. So everything is released through the knowledge of God. Grace and peace is released through the knowledge of God, is multiplied through the knowledge of God and Jesus, his son. And so and, and that's where we get uh, we get uh, every everything for life and godliness. We are connected with our divine nature all of that. And it's interesting that we're not able to connect to that against in an incorrect knowledge of God. Isn't that interesting? So there's knowledge uh, that is being renewed. And those are things that passed down and exposed to be a mere invention of our own imagination. We are active in our imaginations. And if you look throughout scripture and it talks about the imagination, most of the time, it's very interesting, especially in the Old Testament. Imagination is presented in a, sorry, I have a hair. Um, that's going to bug me. Okay. Um, uh, imagination is going to, it only happens when I speak, right? Um, imagination is presented in a negative light with a, with a, with a Tower of Babel. Uh, nothing that they imagine will be withheld from them. So our imagination is so powerful that it's able to create uh, in and of itself. Uh, but it was given to be subdued to the mind of Christ and to, that, that it's a, a blank canvas on which God is supposed to be painting. And so any strokes of that painting that are not God strokes, uh, you know, we, we have issues, we have problems, but it's interesting. So we are, we are powerful in our capacity as, as, as dominion in the earth realm, as an image and likeness of God that we create uh, just as he created. You know, when I was just ministering uh, this weekend and I minister a lot that so many times uh, these inventions that have come have come from experience in our natural settings. And what happens is they create a scenario of our past creates a scenario yeah. that we project into our future and walk into that that future projection. And so this is where, right, that we're being we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds to get in agreement as we're casting down those vain and wicked, those unfruitful and perverse imaginations. We're casting them down uh, so that as we as we project our future, we're walking into the future God has for us. God's imagination is uh, is brilliant and light and whole and health and healing and life and you know abundance. His projection is everything that was released in the garden, where the only thing they had to do was basically tend to the garden and take dominion of it. And when you think of how they tended, they weren't raking, they weren't uh, you know. Uh, you know, uh, digging holes and doing all this stuff. They were speaking to things as their daddy had spoken to things. And, and, and the garden was fruitful and, and, and multiplied. And their, their whole, whole goal was to expand the garden. So operating in that position of rest, where rest doesn't mean you sit and do nothing. Rest means that you operate 
from a place where it's already finished and speak that out and proclaim it forth. That's where the prophetic is because you're speaking that reality, God's reality, God's truth into your future. Yeah. And things are, are, are aligning with that reality. And then you walk into that future. That's, that's part of that unveiling of every good thing in us and uh, that, that, that the faith of God, that faith is made effectual by acknowledging every good thing in us. Well, what is inside you? Everything's inside you, the heavens inside yeah. you speaking that yeah. forth and walking it into and, and things are being conformed into that. So I just think this is brilliant. It's so exciting. I love that. It also said that we arrest every thought. So the easiest time to arrest a thought, uh, a bad thought, a stupid thought, okay, is right at the beginning, man, the more you meditate on that thing, the more it just gets, it can just get to be huge and trying to, 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 to make that puppy obedient later on when you've been meditating on it uh, and, and magnifying it um is is really really difficult so the time is you have rested at its onset uh when wow that's stupid that's not a mind of god thought you rest that puppy then and it's much easier to move forward but the more you meditate on something the stronger it gets and the beauty is is you're, and you're meditating on every good thing in us in christ jesus everything that god is saying about us you know i love bill johnson who says i cannot afford to have a thought that God is not thinking about me. That's right. And that is mm, that is that's, good. And that's where that fruit of self control uh, right. comes into, right? So you know, this is not that we're, we're we're not controlled, but we're given His fruit to operate in self control. The, the the biggest the biggest place that we have to control ourselves it's in our thought life, yes. and so uh, that's yeah. where we. And that means you need to be aware of what you're thinking. If you just Absolutely. let any old thing pop in there, a lot of yeah. stupid is going to come out. It just yeah. does, you know, right? You're, you're like a fish going going downstream. And sometimes the stream of consciousness, uh, you do not want to flow with that thing. <laughs> and it is yeah. important. that's kind of where, uh, where, where our major labor is, laboring to enter the rest. Right. Why? Because there is no rest in the place where it's not finished. And we're not aware. We, we, are, we are under the delusion that it's not finished. And that's where we're working out the salvation that's already completed with fear and trembling. It's fearful and trembling because it's, it's a, a zillion watts of goodness and a two watt fuse, right? So that's pretty uh, overwhelming, right? So you're speaking that thing forth and uh, and things come to pass that, that are the, God, the plans that God has for you and what he's saying about you. Uh, and, and that is why we've been given this incredible gift of self-control, which is developed. That's why we do the disciplines. The disciplines are for us not to get there from here, but to help us to re renew our minds that we're already there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, we are to to labor or make an effort to enter his rest. We don't we don't struggle. No. It's not a struggle. Uh, Apostle Germain, you started this three weeks ago uh, uh, talking about this this need for spiritual warfare, this need for uh, that a lot of people have, but really uh, the, the position of victory is never found in the warfare. It's always found in rest because that's where the father's mind is. The father's mind is at rest and that's the mind we're to operate out of. So talk to us tonight. Take us further tonight. Yeah. Um, I mean, th this is amazing uh, conversation that we're having. Um, and what Apostle Porter and Catherine are, are defining and talking about is uh, uh, conditioning. You know, there's different theories about conditioning, like Pavlov's dog and, you know, how Pavlov's dog was conditioned to, to the bell and responded. And so uh, we've, 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 we've been conditioned uh, culturally. We've been conditioned, you know, within the context of our family. Um, there, there was a study that was done on serfs. These serfs in Europe, these serfs, this community of people, you know, they were they um, generationally they could trace their generation back to uh, the serfs and, you know, being subject to the kings and things like that. And so here you see a generation, you know, that is generations removed, you know, from being, you know, subject to the king and serfs and the lowest of the low and the lowest people on the scum of the earth type people. And, and they still culturally carry that mindset. And so generationally, we can see, you know, even like African-Americans, we talk about generational trauma. Uh, something real happened, you know, in the garden with Adam and that set a course of a generational trauma, you know, that took place upon humanity, you know, of mistaken identity, 
you know, that we've been alienated from God and separated from God. And so uh, we've been conditioned, you know, I'm just merely human, you know, that I have to always do something. Now we do do something, but it's a different type of doing, you know, it's a different type of being, you know, when, when we're uh, unrenewed in our understanding, uh, you know, we think that it's all human effort, you know, so I put, because I've been conditioned to, hey, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, uh, we've been conditioned, listen, you do this, you tie your shoes, you know, so, you know, it's all about this effort, and so effort uh, is some, in, in some instances, we've been conditioned, and, and effort has been empowered, so these things are ingrained, you know, in our memory, we got memory cells, you know, is our neurological makeup, you know, begins to uh, affix itself to a certain identity, you know, to a certain mindset, now this identity and this mindset is, you know, what the medical science call a false positive. You know, it, it has this distinction of sin nature. It has this distinction, you know, that looks like separation. It has this distinction, you know, that looks like, you know, I'm nothing, I'm this or that, you know, but it's a false positive. And so it's not, it's a, it's a reality, but it's not a reality that Father has established for us. And so you see the need for reconditioning. And so what we're talking about it, it is uh, being intentional, you know, in our in our reconditioning, in our mind, being renewed in our mind. Repentance deals with uh, metanoia, deals with changing the way we think. Um, and just to throw in some uh, medical science behind this, there was a, a the study of the power of the placebo. And this is from Harvard Men's Health Watch. Uh, the article, August 9, 2019, it says your mind can be powerful, a powerful healing tool when given the chance. The idea that your brain can convince your body uh, a fake treatment is a real thing. The so-called placebo effect, um, thus stimulate healing has been stimulating healing has been around for millennial. Now science has found that under the right circumstances, a placebo can be just as effective as traditional uh, treatments. And so the placebo effect is more than positive thinking. It's believing a treatment or procedure will work. Um, it's about creating a stronger connection between the brain and the body and how they work together, uh, says Professor uh, Ted Capricorn <laughs> from Medical Science at Harvard. But, you know, here we're seeing the, the this is we ain't even dealing with the language and the talk of faith, you know, in, in and of that what we put how we Christianize faith, you know, but this is a this is a human reality. Or, or spirit reality that God has given us as humanity as a whole. And Jesus restored to us the capacity, the, the accessibility to walk out that divine imagination and reality of sonship, my identity, you know, and then address the false positives in our lives and say, this is, I am not my behavior. I am not who I, you know, I'm not my behavior. I'm not my circumstance or my situation. I'm all that the father is. And who is the father? Like you said, Michael, he is omnipresent. He is omnipotent. He, so that he's everywhere at all times. He is in all things. And he's all powerful. And so when I begin to raise my awareness and wrap my heart and mind around that thinking, my neurological pathways begin to reassign themselves. They call it neuroplasticity. And so they, for a long time, science thought that your, your brain only developed in the child development phases and that, you know, once you got a certain age, your brain becomes a fix. But now neurologists and physicists are finding that, that there's a neuroplasticity that your brain can basically reprogram itself. And so, uh, so one is being intentionally and consciously aware, you know, taking the ownership, the self-control, you know, over what's coming, what we're entertaining in our hearts and our mind. And then the other aspect of that is abiding in the mind, which is, un which is unconsciously uh, conditional, which is taking place because Jesus have already done it. And so it begins to spill over. And so I'm not trying to be righteous. I am righteous. I'm not trying to have peace. And so the more I begin to have these different set of experiences that are no longer false positives, but producing some fruit in my life, like peace and rest. Man, I used to sow a seed and get financial blessings. But now I just meditate and focus on the goodness of God. And I'm seeing financial mm -hmm. blessings and breakthrough in my life. Mm -hmm. And so you see that adjustment that begins to take place in our heart and our life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, now let's let's uh, let's talk about the uh, because 
it seems like by the time we do a round, we've exhausted a half hour. And so uh, I, I want us to get on to, to uh, the, this issue of internal conflict. Uh, when we have uh, memories that or, or thoughts that come up, every thought is triggered. It triggers a memory of the past. Now, let me prove that to you. Uh, in Matthew 4, when Jesus had this, what we label as a wilderness experience, where supposedly this Satan, which is not, it's an English word, it's not a real word. Uh, it, it's actually Satan in the, uh, the, the Hebrew, I believe, in talking about a deceiver, all of that. When he had this encounter, it was not physical. It was in his emotions. Now, here's what happened. This voice says, if you be the son of God. Now, now. John the Baptist had just baptized him and a voice came out of heaven and said uh, that you are the beloved son of God. But this voice of carnality says, if you're the son of God, let's leave off beloved. Let's downplay this. Uh, yeah. Then you can command these stones to be made bread. The response Jesus had was triggered by a memory from his childhood, from Deuteronomy chapter eight, where he addresses that man will not live by bread alone. So even as a Jewish boy, he had learned the law. He had known the, the scriptures of old. So the same thing is true for us. Something happens. We're confronted with something. And all of a sudden, there's a memory that triggers something from our past, a, usually a past church experience, a past family experience, uh, a past scriptural issue that has now brought conflict to us. And you know, I was talking to uh, uh, Apostle Michael uh, earlier this week, um, I don't know, maybe in the last few days, uh, and we, we, we kind of briefly touched on this, uh, you know, the conflict about tithing or the conflict about church attendance or the conflict about, about fasting yeah. uh, or pe how about this conflict, people just struggling to try to get closer to God. Yeah. Uh, these are real things. So what happens is in a moment, all of a sudden I have this feeling come over me, this thought come over me that I'm not as close to God as I really should be. And all of a sudden these it triggers all these memories. Yep. Uh, but I was told this, and I was told if I don't seek God, and I was told that if I don't go to church, if I don't pray a lot, then I'm not close to God. And I was told that Saul, Saul once had this encounter where the Spirit of the Lord said, I'll not strive with man all the time. And, mm -hmm. and all of these things, these triggers come up. And now we're dealing with real inner conflict. Uh, one of the things I love about what we said tonight from 2 Corinthians 10, 4 in the Mirror Bible uh, really speaks volumes to me. And in, in even the, the strategy that we might deal with, uh, it said that uh, that uh, God's ability to disengage minds and perceptions and where that happens is within my own mind, my own belief system. And 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 it's those same types of mindsets that have helped people captive to what the my message the mirror bible uses as pseudo fortresses these these not real situations these not real things but yet i believe in my natural awareness i believe they're real it's like fear uh fear stems from its parent which is that separation mindset there is no separation from god so the whole scenario is not real i have a god identity I don't have a mistaken identity, even though I operated out of one. Yeah. But the truth yeah. about me is I have a God identity. So our mm -hmm. mind can believe some things in a moment of crisis. And all of a sudden, all these memories are triggered yeah. from our past that try to reinforce that. And it becomes this, what the Mirror Bible called a pseudo fortress. These, yeah. pseudo, these not real fortresses and I believe in the fortresses. I feel secure in the fortresses. I feel like I have comfort in the fortresses, but they're not real. So I'm really finding comfort in a false identity. So uh, let's let's deal with this tonight because, uh, you know, as Dr. Catherine uh, went back to, that every lofty idea and argument uh, positioned against the knowledge of God is cast down and exposed to be a mere invention of, of our own imagination. Apostle Michael, how real is that? <clears throat> well, really real. Um, 
I'm just sitting here thinking I have a, um, I have a three-year-old granddaughter named Ella Grace. And when Ella Grace comes to my house, she never tries to be my granddaughter. She just busts right on up in the door and she owns the place and she knows if she asks for something, more than likely she's going to get it if it's within reason and safe for her to have. And she never, she doesn't have to do anything. She doesn't have to, you know, do anything for us to acknowledge she's our granddaughter. Mm. Even when she's bad and has a temper tantrum and has to be corrected, she's still our granddaughter. And so uh, I'm going to say this, I won't speak for the panel I'll just speak for myself. But in my cultures that I grew up in, church was really about manipulation. And it was not very much about relationship. In other words, the moment I walked in the door, I really didn't feel free to be myself. I really needed to, I felt like I needed to be some version of myself, some Christian version of myself. And therefore, I was never really able to share issues or difficulties or whatever I was going through for fear of being open and for fear of all this. And this is not a put down of church. I'm not against church. I'm just right. I'm saying that this manipulation has gone on so much. And through the things that you mentioned, it created so much internal struggle. Of yep. it, it created an awareness of I don't know. Am I, you know, am I right? Or am I wrong? Or am I in? Or am I out? And am I close enough to God? And just the mere fact of being close to God is just a a, a really silly thought. If you think about it, he's already living in you. You're full of the fullness of God. I don't know how you're going to get any closer. Your awareness might grow and expand about him. And so we, uh, many of us, I believe, uh, grew up in this kind of manipulation where we felt like we had to keep doing something, keep getting closer, like you said, give more, do more, even come. You know, I've, uh, I've, I'm, this is not condemnation because I have done this many times myself. OK, I'm going to make that disclaimer. But I still see many people on Saturday night. The popular thing to do is put some kind of post on Facebook about how you better be or you need to be in church on Sunday and it's it's so much guilt. You hate to go fishing if you was planning on going fishing, you know, and nobody oh, even thought about, hey, you could just be as much with God on the boat fishing as you could in the building. Oh, and uh, but, you know, we didn't want to say that as preachers because uh, it even it even worked internally in us as ministers. I'm speaking for 20 years of, of pastoring churches. Uh, it, it, it worked in me in that I felt like we had to have some control over everybody or what would happen, you know, where would they all go and what would they all do? And they needed an overseer and they needed a shepherd. And, and, you know, we thought that we were it, but we weren't really it. We were a pseudo shepherd and a pseudo overseer. What we didn't teach people was Christ in them, the, the overseer and shepherd of their souls. And so yeah. We, we kept people under a, a manipulation. Maybe we did it in ignorance. I get it. I'm not saying, you know, people were doing it on purpose. I don't know each individual case. But the beautiful thing about where we are is that people are beginning to ask questions and people are beginning to formulate, does this really make sense anymore? And uh, it's a beautiful time to be alive. But all of this has been ingrained into our psyche, no matter yeah. what culture or background we came from. And it's still ingrained into many people's psyches. And again, that's not condemnation. That's just where we are. But Jesus comes along and he, he really shows us to me. He really shows us how to walk in love so beautifully. The whole purpose of this thing to me now is love, the experience of love, the growing in love, the, the ability to be able to express the love of God in the earth. And man, to me now, if it's not about love, if you ain't talking love, I'm changing the channel. That's just how I'm going. That's how I'm flowing right now. Yeah. And so this, <laughs> this, this taking dominion within myself, this pulling thoughts down, is it, it, it can really get as simple as that. If it's a, if it's not in in a, if it's not flowing in love, if it's not full of love, if it's not an expression of love, then it's an an error thought. It's an error thought, and it gets really that simple. And so you can evaluate your thoughts. And this again, not condemnation, but as we begin to move in the mind of Christ, we begin to express love. And you know, you just gotta love Jesus so much. I mean, the guy is just so really real and raw. 
And he, he just treats people with such open arms and embraces everyone, including religious people. The only thing he ever really speaks against is the religious mindsets of people. And yeah. so to me, it's all about love. And this thought process that we go through of learning his love, flowing in his love. And, you know, they all, always had this concept that I'm walking here and Jesus is walking beside me. And thank God he's holding my hand. And we used to I used to be in a gospel quartet and sing, and we used to sing that can't even walk without holding his hand. Well, we didn't have a concept that it wasn't him holding my hand. There wasn't two of us there. There were just one of us there. And it was Christ right. in me, the hope of glory, that I was actually walking in the earth as Christ in the earth. This kind of thinking is elevating people into a place where I would say they, they're, we're beginning to have the capacity to understand what real love really is and how to express love in all situations. And to me, it's a beautiful place to be in. And so I see that the spirit within us is acting by this love of God to bring us into a harmonious state, a That's place right. of peace. That's yep. the place of rest we're talking about here. To enter into the rest, not that we're it's somewhere over there and we got to take a journey to go to it, but it's it's within to find the place within the place of rest within. You know that was Israel in the early books of the Scripture. They could temporarily enter into rest, but they never could permanently stay there. They kept going in and out and in and out. And even in the book of Judges, they would get out of rest, and God would send a judge, and the judge would you know, speak out against whatever was causing them unrest. And they would come back in with their thinking. Repentance would be the word, metanoia. They would change their thinking. And, you know, I was looking the other day at some of the judges. Some of them reigned 15 years. And then it said Israel rested for 80 years. They rested for 80 years. But then whenever that judge would die, they would go back into unrest and a new judge would come on the scene. And look, we, we're not in that covenant. We don't need that now, but the principle is still the same. This is not an in and out kind of thing. This is a, what's that song say? This is an everyday kind of love. Every morning you're in it. This is full, complete. This is, this is love beyond, uh, beyond human comprehension. And so I would say, you know, in thinking along these terms of taking thoughts captive, the only way for me to get my thinking in a harmonious state is to think on the level of love, That's vibrate right. on yeah. the level of love, yeah. it, it radiate love. And as we do that, we're able to um, we're able to see every person the same, look past the conditions of the person, look past whatever they're in or out, whatever, it doesn't matter, and see them for who they really are, speak to them for who they really are. This is powerful in the prophetic. If you can't see people in love, you really can't pro prophesy correctly That's to right. a person. That's right. If Really, I believe yeah. if you don't see people in love, you're not really going to prophesy in the spirit to them. You're going to give them a word, and it's going to be a word, but it's going to be a word out of yeah. your consciousness. And so... Yeah. I just I just think all of this is leading us to a place where we understand and walk in the beauty of resurrection life of Jesus. And we walk in the love and the compassion and the understanding of him. If it's not about bringing us into awareness of love, I don't even know why we would go on the journey anyway. And yeah. so I just I just think that this is the purpose of God, the spirit of God working in our lives. And the good news is you just can just experience it. You can just relax in it. You can feel safe in it. I mean, you can you can lean back in Papa's arms and really be yourself. And you can bring all your supposed good things and your bad things, whatever you want to bring. And, you know, again, I'll come back be just quickly before I stop. I'll say that no matter what my grandchildren do, when they come in our house, they're going to be loved on. Yeah. If they made an A in school or they made an F in school, I'm going to love on them the same. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so when the church adopts that kind of level of expression, um, people will be fighting to get to where we are, I believe. Because you don't see it many places in the world, Dr. Bill. You just don't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you talked about the the position from which people prophesy or move in the prophetic the scriptures tell us that we paul said we prophesy according to knowledge and and what i believe he could be implying is that 
you know, the level of understanding of who the Father is will be the influence from which you prophesy from, from which you speak to people from. And, you know, being being a, a uh, you know, theology being my forte, I, I know that, that the hermeneutics of Scripture, uh, the proper lens of Scripture must be determined by Scripture. And in one of my courses, I proved that the proper lens is the lens of love. It you Amen. you must look at all scripture and all people through the lens of love, as hard as that might be sometimes, because we have some deep rooted stuff in us about scripture. And but I've always believed it this way. I've always understood. But but does it measure up to the lens of love? And so I often tell my students, if it doesn't, then that means go back and look at it again because there is another explanation. So, so Dr. Catherine, uh, please talk to us some more about this tonight. Wow. Well, I'm just having such a good time listening to you both and listen to you, Jermaine. I mean, you know, love is my hot button and that's because that's who God love is. God, God is, he is love. Um, and it's true. And, it, and if it doesn't, it doesn't jive with love. It's not through the lens of love. It doesn't pass the sniff test. And you just got to got to cast that puppy out. And I think it's really important to, to, to simplify things because the most profound, most dynamic, most life changing things will boil down to something very simple, but very profound. And we were talking about abiding in the vine. When you abide in the vine, the vine is the person of love. As you abide in love, the fruit pops out effort, effortlessly. And when we disconnect in our mind, this is that, you know, all of the disciplines that we do, if, you know, prayer or contemplative prayer or you know studying the bible or fasting whatever whatever the disciplines are all with that end in mind that we end up abiding growing in the consciousness of who god mm -hmm. is and who we are made in the image and likeness of love himself and the fruit pops out effortlessly right okay. as you remain in me and me and you you will bear much fruit on 15 5 apart from me you can do nothing nothing of eternal value because everything <laughs> resonates at the frequency of love it was made in the image and likeness of love and that is the ultimate agenda love is drawing all things to himself so what does that look like and sometimes um we just get major confusion and i feel like at the root of so many of our issues when it comes to spiritual warfare is an identity issue yep. what happens is we act like it hasn't been finished so we are identifying I, i'm an intercessor i'm a this and i and i get my identity by going to the second heavens and fighting you know dungeons and dragons and all those different things and and so uh people get very upset if i don't have that i don't know who i am yeah. Well, yeah. Let, me, let me say this. I have really good news. I think it's called the gospel. And that is love one, love, love one for us as us. We are made in the image and likeness of love without spot or blemish. It's already been established. It's an issue of awakening. And so where we're laboring to enter the rest is that we're reminding ourselves, you know, the weak, weakness of our frame is that we tend to be forgetful. Either we haven't known or we've forgotten what we've known. And so that's just kind of the, the this is where we float like fish downstream. Well, what I'm saying is that in the place where we are are being energized and activated and, and in every place through the power of love himself, our faith is made effectual through love. It's active, activated and energized and working through love. So it all goes back to that. So it gets to be simple. You know, I remember um, when I was early, early on in my Christian walk and I was a little baby believer with all all of the issues, but whatever, and a lot of just issues anyway. Um, and I was getting ready to marry the love of my life, my sweetheart. We've been married for almost 25 years, but um, but I, I there was this cult that I they seemed to come out of the woodwork. I don't know what it was, but you know, come come suck me into your deal was on my forehead. Anyway, so they came and they were like, you know what, you're not pure enough. You have to have, I don't know, there's something I had to do to purify myself. And for some reason, I just come to think of like, didn't Jesus just actually did that? I got so confused. And I remember calling my pastor, like, right before we were getting married, it's like, am I supposed to be pure? You know, what am I supposed to be doing? And, you know, he was, he gave me some scripture to meditate on. There was a godly woman that spoke into my life and she gave me one piece of amazing advice. And she said, Catherine, when you get confused, retreat back to what you know. 
And so what I'm mm -hmm. saying is, what are you going to retreat to when the confusion comes, when the things that are exalting themselves against the knowledge of God in your body, in your mind, in your finances, in your relationships, in your emotions, in no. your whatever, where do you go? You retreat back to what you know. What do you know? You know that God is love. You know that he loved yeah. you and gave himself up for you. And that, and that causes you to rise up to the level, to the level of his thinking so you can re-enter any rest. Are you guys getting that feedback? Sorry, I didn't know. It sounded like a Mack truck. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the amen chorus. So you can re enter that rest because you are so extravagantly loved. Listen, you cannot rest if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel provided for, if you feel threatened. Yes. There's no way that you can rest. You can't play. Your little three year old granddaughter is in her element. She is so vastly loved that it's already a yes, and she could say the amen for any good thing for her, right? She's extravagantly yeah. loved, whether she prefers performs well, whether she performs badly, love is never at stake. And so we can do that because we've already been chosen. We've already been chosen.